All right, we're back. Uh, this will be section 5.2, uh, part two of chapter five. Uh, this will be the third time I've had some issues with Camtasia. I hopefully have resolved those. And you know, it's a software glitch. You know, it's one of those things. Windows 10 had an update and broke something. But anyhow, TechSmith was great. They fixed it. I'm back online with uh, the video that I could do here. So um, viruses. Yes, we were um, busy working on uh, section 5.1 and 5.2. We're going to talk about how they're classified, which really is uh, in the old days versus the new days. The, I'm more focused on the new days, the host and diseases they cause, the structure, and primarily we're going to be looking at the genetic makeup of these things uh, as really the best way to classify them. Uh, discuss the size of viruses relative to other microorganisms, describe the function, structures of viral capsids, uh, distinguish between uh, enveloped and uh, naked viruses, and we'll talk about what that means, uh, explain the importance of viral surface proteins, and then we're going to diagram uh, various uh, configurations that possess the nucleic acids because that's kind of how we're looking at these things these days, and it's, it's important that we uh, describe them that way. So, uh, my cord got caught in my chair. Sorry about that. Uh, you could see that, and that's why I don't have my video on. All right. So, the general structure, uh, we've already talked about the sizes and things and relative, but just to kind of go over it one more time. Uh, of course, viruses are considered the small ones when you buy a a water filter at the store, 0.22 micron or smaller, um, they don't filter the viruses, uh, some of them, and of course, nor do they get the boost uh, urine out of it uh, that's upstream from where you're camping, but that's okay. Um, the smallest virus is parvo, which causes, uh, parvovirus causes uh, some really disgusting things uh, in dogs, intestinal disruption and they're about 20 nanometers in diameter. The largest is the Mimi virus, which uh, I have yet to be able to print. Uh, my software that I use, uh, it go, this virus pushes all my limits. Uh, it's so big, I, I, I haven't yet, so I'm gonna, I may have to do it in pieces and parts and then glue it together or something, I don't know. It's not the best way to do it. Hopefully the tools will catch up. Cylindrical viruses can be relatively long. Those are your tobacco mosaic type viruses, about 800 nanometers. Uh, they're also narrow, about 15. So it's quite interesting, their filamentous type shape. So I like to focus on various viruses so that we get a good kind of perception of what's going on with these viruses. It's just one of those things. Um, so if you were to uh, click on this in my slide set, uh, you can see that it's going to go uh, to HIV. If you're interested in learning more about HIV, if you know somebody that may be in, inflicted or whatever, uh, there's a wealth of information out there about it. And I just wanted to give that source to you. As you would do your patients, right? You would uh, provide uh, sources like that uh, for your patients. So HIV uh, is very interesting. Uh, it's a little bit... Uh, unique. Uh, this is a rather large one. This was provided by Scripps Institute. I actually printed this. It's the largest one, but it, I had to do it with a specialized program that uh, someone had written that allows me to to uh, image that and uh, to compress it and so that I had enough space memory-wise. The, the, the tools aren't available for the Mimi virus, but it was for HIV. And what I did is I took it and cut it in half, which is really cool. And then the gentleman that actually wrote the software and does a lot with PDB, which I'm going to talk a lot about today, the PDB uh, data bank, uh, that uh, database that is available provides uh, X-ray crystallography files and um, David uh, Goodsell, Dr. Goodsell, uh, this gentleman that uh, is an x-ray crystallographer, and I, we invited him over to Wake Tech, and I got a chance to meet with him for several hours. He's done uh, Molecule of the Month on PDB. It's amazing. you got to check that out. 
anyhow I printed the, this model for him on a Dremel which is a low-end printer and uh, it blew him away he said they couldn't print it on their million dollar printer so I was pretty happy about that not that he couldn't do it on his million dollar printer but um, here's um, another virus you can click on this and uh, the idea behind this one it'll take you uh, to a uh, server and allow you to sort of explore uh, various pieces and parts of that uh, virus design in fact let me show you so if you were to click on that this is where uh, you would see it and you know, let me uh, make the screen a little bit bigger here so you can see that by the way I'm using a, a, a browser called Vivaldi uh, it it's a Chrome type of uh, browser, but it doesn't come with all the bloat that uh, Chrome does, So, and it's compatible. I've been using it for Blackboard. It seems to be working. It's very fast. It's very nice. So anyhow, so if you wanted to know what that particular protein does in this HIV, you can see it's a capsid protein. But the thing I want you to focus on, look at the subunits. There are repetitiveness in this. This capsid it forms a cone uh, around the viral RNA delivered into the cell during infection. But uh, it's assembled like tiles to form these geodesic type of combs. It's not the only thing that does that. Let me click on, um, let's see, the outer, these are the outer um, envelope type proteins. The spikes are formed uh, by these proteins are highly uh, decorated, which is an interesting way of putting it, with carbohydrates, which kind of helps cloak it from the host. And so that's eh, all part of that. One of the things I wanted to point you to also is that PDB, any of these, if you wanted to look at this uh, SU and TM structure, uh, they go by a four number letter designation. And you can type that in any browser and it'll take you to the PDB website and uh, to whatever the molecule is you can download and I'll show you uh, that you can uh, look at various things so if you click in other components in here here's integrase so that's one of the unique things about HIV it has a enzyme that actually helps integrate DNA well you say well how can it integrate DNA when it's an RNA virus. I mean, Dr. V, uh, uh, you're you forgetting something. And actually not, because um, in the mix here, if I can find where it might be hanging out, it's, it's, it's in there, uh, various places, I don't know. Uh, we'll come across it. But uh, in there is a, a protein called reverse transcriptase. And that enzyme takes the RNA and converts it there it is reverse transcriptase and takes uh, RNA makes DNA and then the uh, uh, the integrase uh, will now take that DNA that's been freshly formed by the enzymes in the host cell now these are pirates uh, they come in and take over the cell but the host cell starts to make um, uh, the integrase and the reverse transcriptase so that makes the DNA and now the integrase integrates that into your genome how nasty is that it couldn't be any more nastier and where do you think some of the components come from the lipid bilayer that comes from your cells you provide that in addition to some of the other little goodies the matrix proteins that the virus direct your cells to make and all of these things assemble together uh, for the the entire virus um, to uh, be fully assembled and ready to go so all these pieces and parts there's only like 15 different proteins but there's different numbers of each you can see them represented dr goodsell by the way painted this or did the colorization he's amazing um, you can see his work on uh, PDB, and I'll show it to you later on. But isn't that interesting? And I wanted to show you, and you have full access to this. It's uh, You can go and hit that link, and that will show that uh, for you. And uh, off you go. I hope that was interesting. So HIV uh, was recognized in the 1980s. I remember when it was coming out, it was a debilitating disease. I was at the vet school at the time. And we were worried that it was going to be um, vectored by mosquitoes and things, so we were studying that. And uh, it was uh, SIDS and all sorts of different names for it, but acquired immunodeficiency. Now, let me make a point just to 
kind of drive it home is that uh, you can have the virus infected so you'll have a viral load of HIV but you will not get AIDS uh, until that virus, now this is nasty, and so the virus mutates so it now can attack a T helper cell. Isn't that something? So it, it knows, being RNA, it's got a single copy or just a single strand, so it's more susceptible to mutations, UV and various things, and it will eventually mutate, maybe a year, two years, three years, whatever, and then uh, that will now make it become more infectious more uh, deadly because it now kills a T helper cell line which is the communication cell which we'll talk about in chapters 12 and 13 that uh, helps communicate with the, um, the rest of the immune system so if you take out the communications you're dead in the water and unfortunately HIV folks uh, that have the AIDS uh, develop a severe set of infections and carposis sarcomas and all that because the immune system is down and so we, we we have to try to treat it so we can bring the immune system back reverse transcriptase is unique it it breaks the rule that we say the central dogma theory which is DNA to RNA to a protein well reverse transcriptase first thing we've seen in nature that actually takes RNA and converts it to DNA in the opposite direction. It's an exception, so we allow for those. But uh, it generates a complementary strand to the, R, uh, the RNA strand, so we call that cDNA. And reverse transcriptase enzyme does that. Now I wanted to show you this. These are nooks and crannies of where chemical structures are, they're not there. These represent the atoms and bonds between the atoms and the area of influence of the electrons. So you're seeing a solids model representing sort of the space that these electrons kind of take up these elements that are associated. So that is what they mean by sort of a solids model of 3D. I prefer working with these and these are better to print. Uh, I could do uh, the ribbon version of it, but they're much more delicate, and I think these convey more information, such as where these holes are, could be regions of activity. You can see how pieces, see, this is a quaternary structure of the reverse transcriptase. We have two proteins that interact that has the overall function. One part of it does polymerase, uh, building of uh, DNA. The other is a nuclease where it tears it down. So you can see how they integrate. So charge, shape. Uh, so if this is negative in this region, this has to be positive in that region. And that sort of thing. And this is how these associate. So this is protein structure. And you can see it now is folded in such a way that it, it can actually hold nucleic acid and in this case it's a double strand piece of DNA and it's right in that groove and that's how this works and this subunit is called P66 and this subunit is called P51 and you can see how we represent this. I could print this and put this very model that you're seeing here in your hand so you could explore it but I, I just wanted you to see that that's why I, I believe in uh, doing the solids models 3d printing of these it helps your understanding when you can actually see it and feel it I call it the didactic experience so you can look um, and see that reverse uh, the retrovirus which means that it has reverse transcriptase and it binds to uh, the outer membrane these uh, receptors will bind I like to kind of liken it to pushing the elevator button it calls the elevator and then once the door is open you can kind of descend into what, whatever it's kind of how it is sort of like those uh, airplanes on the deck of an aircraft carrier they go below and that's kind of what's going on here we call the process endocytosis as far as the, our cells are concerned we're trying to bring in something that hey somebody rang the doorbell it's friendly uh, it's not it's just pretending to be and so there's endocytosis it comes in 
Now, these things are really interesting because the way they're assembled and the way they come apart, these actually self-assemble and then they self-disassemble. So they uncoat. They kind of spontaneously fall apart and reveals all the nastiness of the gooey center of the uh, virus or the, uh, the RNA. And then you have already active in there the reverse transcriptase and the integrase. There's a reverse transcriptase and integrase. So it immediately starts making DNA out of the messenger or the viral RNA. It integrates and incorporates it into our genome. And then it starts to manufacture pieces and parts of the virus. They self-assemble. They bud through our phospholipid bilayer and bringing any embedded proteins and the like with it. And so this is a full uh, viron that has that coat all the way around it. So there you go. Now the important part as far as I'm concerned is the integration of the DNA. Now so right now it's a virus factory so that contributes to the viral load and so if somebody has uh, HIV infection, not AIDS, HIV infection, the virus load, this is how we get those high number of viruses in the bloodstream and there's not uh, unless you block reverse transcriptase or other drugs to stop that and then if you can stop it or at least slow it down greatly then the chances of it mutating into uh, a form that stops the T helper cells well there you go that's uh, well, job one so the virus is now uh, are, are trying to propagate and it's waiting for a mutation it where it now shifts to AIDS where you actually um, have your immune system affected there's no vaccine there's numerous drugs in, in the day back in the 80s that used to be six, seven thousand dollars a week and you'd have to have an alarm clock to wake you up at certain times to take those meds that would make you vomit and sick and feel awful and I, I just feel for that. It's just a horrible scenario. The drugs have gotten better but they still have side effects and various things and the problem is HIV virus becomes resistant to it. So they switch to different drugs and then after a while they become sensitive to the drug that you initially uh, used so you can switch it back and they're finding that the viruses have a harder time mutating back to what they originally were at one time. Don't ask me why, I don't know. But that's what I, I, I've been reading. So we're still looking at about 2 million new infections every year which is uh, really sad. Uh, HIV, uh, the virus, is from the retroviridae, which makes sense, it's retrovirus, and it's a family, there's um, several that have the re reverse transcriptase, so we clump them together. Um, it's enveloped particle with a conical core, in other words it has this conical shape, and that's where it holds the um, nucleic acid. It's linear, single-stranded RNA genome of about 9,700 base pairs. Okay, they thought it um, evolved from a uh, a monkey uh, with uh, immunodeficiency, but um, the uh, HIV is distinct because it infects only humans, and there's of course no vaccine. And if you look at the structures, um, I've kind of already gone over this. It has a little bit more detail if you're interested in these things. Uh, but uh, each of these have a certain feature. But what the reason I showed this uh, again is look at the genetics behind it. I'm not going to have you worry about it. But the virus has has a really pretty uh, complicated way of manufacturing each of these proteins that stick together. And it forms this terrible, terrible virus. There is the conical shaped capsid protein that's on the inside of that virus. If you remember that big white uh, rotation I did with, with the adherence mechanisms, this is on the inside plus all the, packed with all its luggage for doing some of the nasty things that it has to do to, once it gets in the cell. So um, HIV is one of those complex viruses surrounded by a membrane filled with diverse collection of viral and um, cellular molecules that uh, it doesn't make, you make it. And it does it under direction and under duress and you make it and, and just, just awful. Now if you're interested in finding out more about this virus and you can view it in 3D and do 3D rotations and the like, go to PDB. Just type in once you uh, just 
Google PDB and it, it'll give you a link and then you can go to to the main and you can just type in HIV and it'll take you but there's the uh, four letter number designation for each of various things so if you were just to type that number into the search box you would get that there is a free built-in to your browser uh, capability NGL is a browser based uh, visualizer and it does it in 3D so you can do 3D rotations with that. There's a, a simple viewer that uh, it doesn't take much uh, resource that you can do is free. Protein Workshop, you can look at proteins, a little bit more in depth type of uh, modeling you can do with that. Uh, but you can download any of the x-ray crystallography files for the download files and there's one in particular if you download that we can now go through a process and uh, make uh, a 3d model so uh, if you're interested in finding a protein or let's say a virus that you would like to study and you would like it printed now there's certain tools that I have and I'll show you the process and how it's done and uh, as a voiceover and I might use one or two of the suggested uh, ones as a sort of a model that I'll do a voiceover so you can see it and how it was done and kind of take you through the steps and uh, then 3d print it I have uh, a Dremel that's got a camera so you can actually see it being printed and uh, so anyhow it, it, if you're interested in doing that let me know I've already had a student uh, uh, let me know uh, that they would be interested and uh, by all means I do the best I can in the time that we have uh, it doesn't have to stop at the end of the semester we can continue it on in the fall I do start research uh, projects with students and there is funding for it and if you're interested um, I can get you the literature just shoot me an email and I'll see what I can do so um, there's the HIV I've already kind of shown it but there's all the proteins and things it's kind of interesting and uh, you can click on that and it'll take you to the site now the next virus I wanted you to look at was Zika virus we've probably or you've probably heard about it uh, because it causes birth defects it's a really kind of a strange thing we're seeing it uh, vectored by mosquitoes and uh, the Zika virus is transmitted so you can you can hit and get the, the JPEG of this yeah, which is just a file so you can see that this was colorized by uh, David Goodsell Dr. Goodsell did this at Scripps Institute uh, he has a certain strategy the way he does it to highlight certain characteristics it's amazing these are various clusters of repetitive type of protein subunits uh, each of the different colors and then these are mechanism uh, proteins that it uses to adhere to a tissue the tissue trophism that I've been uh, harping about so um, this is 3D rotation of a Zika virus but you can see some of the subunits what I wanted you to see is how well they fit together and yes you can see through some of the holes it shows you how the proteins kind of interact these are repetitive subunits this thing will self-assemble and line up in such a way that all of this just comes together which is really a very disturbing thought so there's the Zika virus is an artistic rendition I'm just showing you the uh, it's got an RNA um, uh, chromosome which is DNA or RNA never both uh, you can see that the similar things a lipid envelope just like we saw with HIV uh, membrane proteins that uh, this virus had you make and assembled and uh, all sorts of nastiness is there so that's the Zika virus the next one I wanted to show you was another nasty one called Ebola this is from the Flavoviridae family uh, which includes the Marburg virus which is the most deadly virus I think it's got that title it's, it's awful just awful uh, there's an equivalent disease in horses unfortunately I uh, had witnessed it's equine encephalitis and it seems like all the connective tissue just kind of just falls apart and they start bleeding from all orifices and uh, and horses all we can do is destroy them all because it's such a painful terrible thing and we don't want it to spread and so that's what has to be done which is horrible absolutely horrible I love horses um, 
And so it's got a linear single-stranded RNA, much bigger than the HIV. If you remember, HIV was like 7,900 base pairs. It's 19,000. Infects humans, primates, and bats. And vaccines are currently being tested, and I hope that comes out soon. Killing more than 11,000 people. I have a theory as to where Ebola comes from, and uh, at some point, to uh, right chapter, uh, I'll discuss it and see what you think. There's the uh, protein configuration. You can see that it's similar in some ways. It kind of looks like a tobacco mosaic where it's kind of stacked and circular. Uh, you can see that the glycoproteins, matrix, nucleoproteins, and how all these things fit together. It's just nasty. And it's designed to, to really um, cause problems. So I like trying to be consistent for the different types of uh, viruses you can see again it's a glycoprotein it's the way it tries to stealth itself from the immune system uh, it's got RNA genome and nucleocapsid proteins and polymerase um, so it can take care of business once it gets in your cell uh, you're gonna make all of this uh, so uh, the outbreaks and you can see in 76, 96, 2001, I had a student that did a report on this. Uh, we printed the, uh, the virus and she did an honors project with it. She did a really, really good job. She's in, in nursing school at Wake Tech. She, she she's, uh, did a really good job with this uh, Ebola virus. And she actually lived in an area where Ebola was uh, uh, could be found. So she knows firsthand about what it can do. And I just thought her insight was amazing. But anyhow, you can see in 2014, the outbreak is uh, rather large and it, it seems to be isolated from wherever it is. Um, so it's not their problem, it's everybody's problem. That's what I always try to say. We need to help as best we can. So here's the size comparisons of some of the ones that we've been talking about. Um, but there's some that we haven't talked about. Uh, the polio virus. Uh, there's the hemoglobin molecule you can see in comparison. That's just uh, It's a quaternary structure for proteins that fit together adenovirus the influenza or flu virus HIV you can kind of see HIV is bigger rabies I actually uh, a, a cat came in and I was uh, for rabies observation and it bit me uh, the, the handler that was with me started to to rotate the cat towards Doc and of course my job uh, was to prevent Doc from getting bit so I got bit and so I had to have those shots which I needed anyhow for the vet school but uh, those were back where they had the 200 mile long needles no I'm just joking they were long needles and you get 12 of them across your stomach and that's not fun and soon after that they changed it so it's not such a rigmarole now herpes there is that Mimi virus I can't seem to print right now. And uh, so anyhow, um, there you go. Uh, viruses bear no resemblance to cells and lack any of the protein synthesizing. See, we always talk about, you know, is it alive or not? We, we've been through that. But the idea is that it doesn't need to do any of that. It's a pirate. It's going to make you do it. So the only, it, it's really infectious genetic material is really what we're talking about here. And so once this material gets its way in because of the external coatings and the attachments and all that, then that at that point becomes a nucleic acid infection. So we got some terminology. It's not too much for this uh, section, but capsid is a protein shell that surrounds the nucleic acid. So the nucleocapsid is more detailed. It's the capsid with the nucleic acid. Naked viruses consist of only the nucleocapsid. That's what a naked virus is. It doesn't have the host uh, phospholipid bilayer outer part of it. Um, the envelope is an external covering of a nucleocapsid, usually a modified piece of the host membrane. So this is the opposite of being naked. It's got uh, the envelope around it. Spikes can be found on naked or enveloped ones. Um, they project out, and I have a kind of a 
artist rendition of that. So there's the spikes. These are used for the host specificity, the tissue trophism that I keep hammering. And this is where it binds. If it can't bind the receptor properly, this virus is not going to uh, affect. But if these match the receptors uh, and you're it, um, you're going to get whatever is uh, nucleic acid is encoded in the programming that's on board here. You're going to get it. There's not a whole lot you can do about it. Uh, capsids uh, is the most prominent feature. Uh, the key and why I included the slide is that they self-assemble. They're built of subunits. You see, it's a reoccurring theme from virus to virus to virus is that they're made up of these small protein subunits and together they build together and they, they build these functional viruses that are just uh, well, you know, it, it's just awful. And then to have us pay for it, in other words, they build it under our watch, that's just terrible. So you can see the cr crappy slide here just showing uh, some of the ones that have capsids and ones that uh, are not. Bacteriophages, really interesting bacteriophages. These are little legs. At first they thought it was just for attachment, but this actually moves, it walks on surfaces of um, bacteria and the things and so this segment here is from the collar on down it kind of scrunches and gets shorter and the DNA it were, uh, yeah the DNA gets inserted right into the uh, uh, bacteria and um, it's kind of like an injection needle and uh, off it goes so enveloped viruses take a bit of the cell's membrane uh, they can bud from the cell membrane nuclear envelope or endoplasmic reticulum depending on where they are types of virus so here's an enveloped one here's a non-enveloped one you can see that what's missing in the non-enveloped one is the membrane that the uh, host has um, surrounding it that uh, hey you know it comes from us so the influenza virus it's uh, an enveloped virus now you can see RNA segments and the H and N spike now this is H1N1 you've probably heard that kind of the the, uh, determination well that's uh, because of these structures that are required to bind to the host and so when a particular virus infects the specificity in tissue trophism is with these receptors we've already talked about this nothing new um, except in this it's got a different class of receptors and, and the way they bind to things uh, so that's hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. These are enzymes that, uh, that do the, the work for binding. So influenza virus is an orthomyxovirus or myxoviridae. Um, the genome is about 13, uh, 500 base pairs or so. It's an RNA. So we've been looking at a lot of RNA viruses. We do uh, have vaccines for this. They infect humans, pigs, and animals, various different types. And you can see some of the designations, one that caused emerged H1N1 in 2009. And these can uh, actually get co-migrated or co-infected with the host and we can get a blending effect and I, I'll talk a little bit about that but there's the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase uh, the the word that ends in an IN can be a protein uh, and serve as an enzyme or it can be just a protein ACE is an enzyme it's a protein but it has uh, the enzymatic activity this can do more than just enz enzymatic activity and so uh, that's the difference and so we classify it could be h3 n4 things like that is how to classify them and rna virus matrix protein attack rate influenza has annual attack rate of five to ten percent of adults and 30, 20 to 30 percent in children aren't we glad that the the covid virus is sort of the opposite of that it's not infecting the children like the influenza virus so here's um, the uh, various components, pieces and parts, the neuraminidase, hemagglutinin, and then segmented uh, RNA uh, genome. In other words, they're segmented. The D is sort of like when it infects and then it sends out these little cassettes out into your um, genome and you make each of the products from that RNA. Um, 
there have been four four flu pandemics. And I, I wrote this before the the latest one. Um, it, it kind of spooky when I think about it. But anyhow, they occurred in 1918. See, they always taught me in class that every hundred years we get a pandemic. So in 19, so now we're 2018, which would be a hundred years from that, and we hadn't seen it. And it's like, oh my gosh. And so we kind of thought that maybe the H2N2 was the new pandemic now. Uh, 68, the H3N2, hmm, no, it didn't really. 2009, I was close, H1N1, it's kind of back to the original. And it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, when the next pandemic, boy, that's kind of prophetic, isn't it? Uh, so that's where we are. So I mentioned the blending. It can have a co-infection of two uh, different uh, strains of viruses, and um, which can happen in COVID, by the way. Uh, uh, I studied uh, COVID virus, uh, the similar uh, SARS virus uh, that affects cats, coronavirus and cats. And the problem with that one is it can mutate and become infectious again, and the host sees it like for the first time again. That's scary. I don't think the the virus that we're dealing with does that, but God, I hope not. So strain A, strain B, they can combine, and then you get this blended effect of viruses that now can affect maybe multiple hosts and things like that. And this is this has been documented over the years, various different types. And uh, you don't have to know. I just wanted you to know that there's evidence for this concept. So just to review the capsid structures, we have the naked one, of course. It's, uh, naked helical viruses are very rigid. Uh, enveloped ones uh, have uh, covering that are, of course, created by the phospholipid bilayer from the host impregnated with various proteins that the virus decides. Um, we have a, a adenovirus that is naked, but it has the host receptors sticking out from it. How huh, scary is that? Um, it is nasty. And then uh, enveloped icosahedral type uh, hepatitis, uh, herpes simplex, that sort of thing. Uh, then you have the bacteriophages. And it's complex and it has na names for all of these, but these are very real. Uh, they're out there. Uh, nucleic acids at the core of the virus is the genome. Uh, the sum total of the genetic information is carried by an organism. Viruses uh, contain DNA or RNA, but not both. Please remember that. Highlight that. Underline it. Commit that to memory. Uh, the number of viral genes is quite small. Compare that with a cell. Four genes in hepatitis B. That's it. The hepatitis can do all its nastiness to the liver with four genes. Hundreds of genes in some herpes viruses possess only the genes needed to invade the host and redirect their activity. Uh, it's, um, it shows them how to become uh, pirates. So here is the different types of viruses. We can have DNA viruses or RNA vi viruses. We know DNA can be double-stranded, circular like in bacteria or linear in humans. So we know those are pretty common. The single-stranded DNA is a little odd. Um, so that, but there are viruses out there that are single-stranded DNA. RNA viruses, they can be double-stranded, which m many students aren't aware of DNA, I mean RNA being double-stranded, but it can be. It's most, li most likely single. Positive sense strand, these are two terms I want to delineate. Positive means that this is essentially messenger RNA. This is in the right um, uh, strand, so this is messenger RNA. The negative sense strand would be the complement to the messenger RNA, so we would have to, to uh, convert that to the sense strand before it could be translated, because obviously it would be junk otherwise. Uh, segmented, in other words, it has uh, small segments. It's not linear sometimes, it's just broken up into small pieces, which for whatever reason, it's to its advantage to do that. And retroviruses carry their enzymes to take the RNA and make DNA from it. So, hmm, isn't that lovely? So here is just a summary of, of the different types of RNA and DNA viruses. And I would say of, of one of the major things to do, there may be a matching question on um, the exam that uh, wants to see if you can put some of these together. And um, so herpes and uh, 
is a double-stranded DNA and parvovirus is a single-stranded DNA so that kind of helps with that. Single-stranded positive polarity, in other words, is a messenger-like type of uh, RNA virus, a polio. A single-stranded uh, negative polarity, in other words, we're going to have to make a complement strand, influenza. Hmm. Double-stranded RNA, rotavirus, causes nasty diarrheal disease. And then single-stranded RNA, reverse transcriptase, like HIV. So there you go. If you could uh, take 5.3 table to, to heart, that would be good. Uh, other substances in the virus particle, enzymes for specific operations. So when they come in, they're, they're ready to roll. Uh, it's like bringing their machine guns and nunchucks and uh, all sorts of stuff to, to complete what they need to do as pirates. And they completely lack the genes for synthesis of metabolic enzymes. They don't need it. Lean, mean, extremely nasty machines. How do you like that? Uh, some viruses carry away substances from their host, like tRNA. I mean, they just steal, pillage, do whatever it takes. It leaves the place a mess, kills the host. So 5.3 is uh, really quick. We'll kind of go through it. I'm not going to have you go into too much detail. I kind of view this as a higher level type of um, material for a different course. But it gives you sort of the summary of everything we've already talked about. Viruses are minute parasites. Mm, okay, nothing new there. Nature of the virus replication cycle is the way the viruses are transmitted, host and responses and all that, which is important. We, you know, it all affects and how it multiplies. So if you think of the uh, bacteriophage, the regular virus is the animal virus. It's absorb in other words they attach they get inside they uncoat they start synthesizing all the crap that they wanted only for them they, they tell the cell to stop making their stuff then they self-assemble and then out they go and if you need to remember that order a pulsar is a good acronym i use uh, these things all the time uh, i remember private tim hall gives you all the essential amino acids it's the first letter of each of the amino acids in Private Tim Hall. And I remember that from high school. It's a very powerful mnemonic tool for memory. And that's why sound bites, when politicians use sound bites, that's why people remember them. It's just simple little things like that. So you can see absorption of the bacteriophage just attaching to the cell. And then once it penetrates, I'll give you a few minutes to memorize this. No, it just shows that it's penetrating, getting its ugly nastiness inside. But the absorption part, do not just glaze over that. The virus can invade the host only through making an exact fit, locking key. In other words, it's, you've got to have the key to unlock that door. If that key doesn't work, eh, it's not going to happen. Uh, so there are some people that are just naturally immune to HIV and it's because of that the key does it fits the lock but it won't turn it and so lucky them so host range a limited range of cells the virus can affect hepatitis all this is showing is down here the specificity the trophism in other words it's only for specific types of cells hepatitis B is liver polio virus hits the intestinal and nerve cells only those two types rabies the various uh, brain cells of mammals and uh, it's nasty cells that lack compatible virus receptors are resistant to absorption and it isn't going to happen and so that's it's the kind of the downstroke for a virus either it hits the numbers and got that key just right and doesn't miss a lick or if that key doesn't work well they're out standing in the rain which I don't mind uh, so the absorption, you can see the sort of like pushing the little doorbell buzzers or the uh, opening the the, uh, uh, the elevator. You push a button, and then next thing you know, it's it's moving in. Um, it's uh, kind of fake. So absorption is just specifically only for the uh, hepatitis B liver cells, and it, when it does, it affects the the liver, and you get. Uh, I had a neighbor with it and it was sad to see her eyes started turning green her skin started turning green oh it was awful and I couldn't stop it and uh, she finally succumbed to it so you get the jaundice is associated because the belly rubin's not being removed like it's supposed to be and things like that 
and so you see that and um, anyhow it's sad and hopefully we'll I deal with that polio virus the intestinal nerve very specific for that and so the polio virus kind of looks like that I actually printed this one um, and it has um, receptor you can see uh, binding CD 155 it's, it's a specific receptor and when it does um, the polio myelitis virus invades the motor neuron causing the motor neuron to die and the muscles uh, atrophy and uh, that's really nasty and then of course if you can't uh, breathe you're using the, the muscles in your rib cage well then you need iron lungs and this is how just horrible and these are patients are doomed essentially I mean there's really no hope of recovery and the only reason they're staying alive is because that lung is providing uh, the uh, the iron lung or the, the um, these um, special containments provide that pressure to allow the lungs to expand so you can breathe I mean I'm claustrophobic so I would not have a happy day being in one of those things um, so it's not uh, new it's old it's actually we see um, evidence that they've had these sorts of things like polio way back in the Egyptian times so uh, here's a, a iron lung and paralyzed and going into these kind of uh, ventilators um, uh, I actually uh, I scuba dive and uh, this is a risk if I get bends or bent as they say in other words I descended too fast and I get um, tissue damage as a result of different gases uh, leaving too fast sometimes I have to go you would have to go in an, into an iron lung to uh, try to get rid of some of those gases that are impregnated to your tissues various tissues so anyhow they're still used today uh, penetration uncoating uh, some of the major uh, breakthroughs of these gentlemen here uh, Jonas Salk he saved so many lives it's just amazing uh, what he was able to do and the saving vaccines and uh, really really smart people um, and it's just really it's amazing what the contributions of mankind uh, have like these gentlemen so uh, penetration uncoating getting uh, the virus is in there and uncoating it so you can get all the features of the enzymes and the, the uh, RNA or DNA in there um, to start it's pretty obvious and uh, the flexible cell membrane of the host is penetrated of course endocytosis it's I we've already gone over that this is kind of just rehashing and this is the diagram uh, broken in a little different way but saying the same thing it's it's going in releases its nastiness and then uh, it, it does all the pirating and then it kind of reverses in the opposite direction um, so anyhow it's when it leaves it's, it's just really really ugly synthesis uh, that's when it builds all the things that it's going to do DNA viruses RNA viruses um, I kind of work similar uh, retroviruses turn their RNA genomes into DNA and then they incorporate it into the genome so uh, we can go directly with the DNA viruses RNA viruses are replicated and assembled in the cytoplasm and that's about the best they can do um, so that's good uh, double double strand DNA viruses in the early phases the viral DNA enters the nucleus uh, RNA transcript moves and off it goes um, late phase parts of the genome are translated into proteins required it makes new things so either they go dormant inside or they start um, being produced this sort of does the same sort of uh, what we talked about with the negative and positive uh, table 5.5 kind of helps you see visually some of the viruses that uh, with the different DNA or RNA types and it's just a good review we've talked about all of these things and um, so the length of replication cycle varies from 8 to 36 hours and that's just nasty uh, it's it just phew, geez. Wow. so assembly and release a lot of just to keep in mind that it's uh, self assembles at the at the end releases the number of viruses uh, could be like pox virus infected cell it releases three to four thousand of those things polio a hundred thousand 
and then there are others that release even more it's just incredible they just become these machines that just dump viruses and uh, it depends on the, uh, the the overall well-being of the host and their life cycle again it's a little bit more delineated uh, it's it's nice just to kind of review it uh, the cytopathic effects those are the actual uh, damage to the skin or if you had a cell line you'd see plaques in the cell line in other words these little zones are clearing and so we call them CPEs cytopathic effects when you see that word don't freak out CPE is a cytopathic it's a damage that the virus causes the cell and you can see it with a microscope and the gross changes in shape uh, Succinctia is a fusion of multiple host cells in a single. We see this a lot with virus infected cells. If you remember the inverted microscope where the optics were underneath and then you look at a tissue culture that's been stained, uh, usually to look at uh, cytopathic effects of cells. So here, chicken pox you can see is infected uh, by the varicella zoster virus in most cases in children under 15 but older children and adults can get it uh, chicken pox is uncomfortable itchy rash everyone's kind of seeing the dmo of that and it's just to make you uh, there's the herps uh, varicella zoster uh, molluscum contagiosum sounds like something from uh, uh, the Harry Potter series there. Uh, herpes simplex, you see the sort of yellowish fluid in those. That's highly infectious. So be careful when you're dealing with patients to always wear hand, gloves and face masks and things. You don't want to get it. You can get it. It will, if the receptor is there, it doesn't care. Um, I always worry about these sharing towels and clothing. I, you won't see me doing that at any of these hotels and things. I bring my own stuff. Uh, wrestlers, I used to wrestle when I was in high school. I made it through it, but boy, ugh, nasty. I don't know, whatever. So you can see cold sores spread from person to person, uh, such as kissing and all that. No, thank you. Um, genital herpes, same sort of thing. And there's uh, shingles rash. I got the shingles vaccine. Ow, ow, ow. I had two, two rounds of the vaccine. Uh, but you don't want to get shingles. Uh, shingles, uh, and family member got it, and she didn't see a doctor, and she just thought it'd go away, and it did eventually. But it popped her eye. It got into her eye, and it uh, weakened the sclera, and the eye popped. And so um, there you go. She's now blind. Uh, she's gone now, but that uh, wasn't helpful. So there's uh, shingles, and that's a big deal. You'll see patients with shingles. Uh, persistent infections, proviruses, and chronic latent states. Now, one of the problems you saw that uh, in, the integrase with HIV, what that does is inserts the genome of that virus into our genome. And some viruses, like when I got the vaccine uh, for polio, it was a multiple vaccine, it was contaminated with the uh, SV40 virus. Now, my guess is your parents were as well and uh, sv40 viruses causes cancer because it, it in integrates into our genome and when it does that it leaves all sorts of nastiness and integrates and causes disruption of genes and some of those disruptions can cause cancer so in my my uh, group of folks that were lucky enough to get the sv40 virus vaccinated into us by mistake if you think that uh, so uh, there's a higher incidence rate of colon cancer in our age group so uh, about 25 to 30 percent higher as a result they think of the SV40 virus in addition to other things so isn't that wonderful it's amazing I'm still here I don't know uh, viruses and cancer as experts estimate 20 percent of cancers are caused by viruses well, because if they go in and at the molecular level and start inserting themselves in the sorts of genes and things. Uh, certain terms I want you to be aware of. Uh, oncogenic. Now, onc just, onco is, is cancer in Latin, sort of cancer-causing viruses. So when a cell is happy and normal and then gets transformed by a virus, we call that transformation. 
and that viruses carry genes that directly cause cancer. Other viruses produce proteins that induce the loss of growth or regulation leading to cancer. So uh, it can be direct or indirect is really what it's saying. And um, so nothing new here. We've already talked about that. And transforming cells. And uh, transformed cells increase the rate of growth, as we know with cancer. Uh, changes in surface cell capacity to divide indefinitely. Oncoviruses, mammalian viruses capable of initiating tumors. Well, we know the papillomavirus, HIV, you know, it's a uh, STD. Herpes virus, hepatitis B virus, HTLV1. Uh, all of these are oncoviruses. Um, so it's nasty. Um, there's a higher incidence rate of uh, Carposi sarcomas with HIV, and they thought it was due to the AIDS virus, but it was actually due to the herpes virus, a co-committant type of infection. And then the fact that your immune system's not there to clear these early tumors, it, it's, it's just awful. It's a lose-lose scenario. Uh, so you can read through these slides I, uh, if you had some questions as to how once it genetically gets in and causes HIV. I just leave these slides in there so you can do you know, look at them. But I'm not going to ask any specific question um, about these. I told you I was not going to really worry about that. The bacteriophage, which means bacteria eating, um, it, it's the same. Uh, in fact, we use these viruses, the bacteriophages, to understand what was going on with uh, human viruses or the uh, mammalian viruses. So T even bacteriophages only infect E. coli. Uh, so T2, T4, those sorts of things are E. coli type uh, bacteriophages. And they all have similar structures as this and they incorporate their DNA by kind of scrunching in like an injection needle there and they've proven that and so that's all that's saying is just a lot of detail associated with it but I'm not going to ask you that so that's it um, uh, it's all I'm going to worry about uh, on the exam uh, so uh, we'll stop here and I um, uh, appreciate your time and uh, I'll catch you on chapter 6 this week.